Did you know that 90% of the world's millionaires invest in real estate? Well, I'm Angel with the Academy Presents Real Estate Investing Rocks, and I'm here to help you if you want to go for your piece of that pie. If you buy a commercial property, you can't just turn that into a trailer, um, into a mobile home community. It has to be zoned mobile home. Yeah, I mean, you got to have the relationships with City Hall. City Hall has to approve it. I mean, you got to, that's why, again, I'm going to talk about that here in a second. Um, building relationships with the people at City Hall, specifically your economic development, your planning and zoning, the city inspector, the fire marshal. Um, these are all really good people that you're going to need at some point while you own it, most likely before closing. Um, so it's always best to be the first one to be proactive and just go introduce yourself while you're, while you're under contract. Um, what, after you submit your offer, just let them know who you are, that you actually have good intentions. Um, and then you, you have to get their approval to rezone uh, their property, right? So um, a lot of times, unless some of those uh, people who work in City Hall are like capitalists and they own mobile home parks and they really love and they support that idea, then it's going to be tough to rezone an existing commercial property, whether it's raw land, to zone something else. Um, but it's, I, I don't want to say never say never. It's always worth a shot. It's always worth a shot to just go talk to them and be like, Hey, this is my idea. But yet if you prove to them that you're real, you know, Hey, I have this idea. And then like, you don't really give them any more feedback. You can't, you're not really selling to them that you actually know what you're doing or that you have the, the capital or that you have the knowledge or experience to do it. Then they're probably not gonna be on your side. But if you go there and talk to them with your full blown business plan with maybe a credibility book, proving who you are, that you have experience, that you have capital, maybe you show them your proof of funds. Um, then it's going to be a lot more likely if they're even considering it, if, if that makes sense. Does that answer your oh, question? Yeah, absolutely. Sweet. Um, so uh, another couple more disadvantages, you know, a lot of the park owned home parks, some of the parks that we look at the mo they're mostly park owned home and, and sometimes we can get a great deal on them. But a lot of times the maintenance, uh, you know, because mom and pops who own these, a lot of times they do their own work. So they don't report whenever they do maintenance on trailers. So it could look repairs and maintenance are, Hey, it's only like a thousand bucks for the year when realistically they worked on it every month, but they just didn't document all those hours and all that labor. But if you're, unless you're going to go do it yourself and you're okay with not paying yourself, then you have to be conservative and factor that in. And that's where sometimes you don't know, you know, you have to just be very conservative and kind of know what, what the, what the rule of thumbs are for, you know, based on the condition, based on the age, how much usually per year, you know, and that's usually two, two to three hundred dollars a month per unit. Um, if, if it's an older unit, like 80s, probably 90s or older. Um, so many, many parks are situated in like the southeast or the Midwest where there's tornadoes and hurricanes and stuff like that. So just having the right insurance, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't buy because some of these that are in these flood zones or in these hurricane or tornado zones haven't had any kind of disaster hit them in years and years and years. That doesn't mean it won't. That might mean that, hey, they're due for one, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't buy them because of just having that fear. Um, flood zones are a little different. A lot of times if it's in a flood zone, it's because it actually has flooded in the last five to 10 years um, and it's caused damage. But that's the purpose for due diligence. That's the purpose for ins the right insurance. Um, and, you know, if something happens, having a contingency plan for what you're going to do with your residents um, who can't afford to move or can't afford to stay in the hotel. So again, that's, that's the right type of insurance coverage and, and make sure you, you, you're building a relationship with the right insurance broker for those types of situations. So like case in point, mobile home parks are not for everybody. There are more disadvantages, but there's a lot more advantages that, I mean, again, we don't have time to bring up. We love them. We buy them. There's always a way to, around to figure out every obstacle, but a lot of these disadvantages are what scare people away, which hey, make more opportunities for us to just figure it out. Maybe put a little more time and effort, maybe reach deeper into our networks and who could help us and who's done this already to go, just go figure it out. Right. And be that, have that success mind. So, um, these are some kind of keys to profitable and successful investing. And, and so, some of these do apply to, to apartments and mobile home parks. You know, number one, you have to make sure you understand the market and you do your market due diligence. I talked about that. 
um, kind of before and, and the key metrics are here at the bottom. Um, you know, make sure that there's actually, there's most likely going to be a demand for affordable housing, but only in those markets that show, you know, employment growth, strong, um, you know, population growth, di diverse employment. Like I said, the average home price, no, no less than hundred K. Um, and so a lot of the trade, these trailer parks are situated in secondary some tertiary markets where it might not, there might not be a huge demand because population has gone down and there's just not jobs. So people are just not living there. Right. So, um, make sure you do your, your ad, very adequate market due diligence first. Um, when, when I say municipal utilities, that means city water and city sewer versus your private utilities like the septic tanks and lagoons and the wastewater treatment plant and, and stuff like that. And it doesn't automatically mean that city water is better. Um, a lot of people think it is because there's a direct billing with the city. But either way, if it's city water, city sewer that it was developed, you know, 50 years ago, this is still going to be your responsibility to understand what the condition is. If it breaks, it's on you. If the lines rupture, it's on you. A lot of the times we're, we're looking at parks that have all these beautiful trees, but guess what happens <laughs> underground? Yeah. Those roots are going to snake around those lines, crack them, destroy them. And that's on you as the owner to make sure. So municipal utilities aren't always the best because if you take a look at those compared to a private utility that was cared for and it's in great condition, I would rather have a private utility, even if I know nothing about it, I'd figure out who the experts are in the area to, for due diligence. I would figure out how to use them and maintain them you know, if it was really well maintained versus the city water, city sewer who have old metal lines who are all corroded and cracks and stuff like that. But we boroscope all of our lines um, during um, all our due diligence to, to make sure we know exactly what we're getting into. Obviously PVC is the newest and the best. Um, PVC is always, always, always going to be the best just thick plastic uh, lines instead of old metal lines that corrode. Um, but uh, a really good national company that can help you with that is ALD American leak detection. They are kind of nationwide and they can help kind of boroscope those lines for you, whether you're looking at apartment communities or mobile home communities, they're everywhere. Um, and they're very affordable. They have great systems in place and they're quick and they got great customer service from our, um, from our experience. So uh, another thing when you're analyzing deals, you know, sometimes it's park owned homes. You have a lot of park, uh, unit or unit rent plus lot rent. But when you're factoring in for analysis, only, only add in the lot rent itself. Um, again, that's the, all that's capitalizable. And also most owners who own these park owned homes are going to eventually lease it back to the resident. So you're going to eventually lose that income. So it's always best to only factor lot rent into your numbers when you're analyzing deals. And, uh, you know, in addition to that, you know, um, moms and pops and regular owners, even if they're sophisticated, they will put a value on those homes. They will put a value on that gross park owned rent. Um, so you, I mean, just, just understand that you, in order to be the most conservative and to buy it right, it's only, you, you know, make sure you're only factoring lot rent. Cap rates are higher than in mobile home parks than they are in apartment complexes straight up. Um, that's one of the reasons why we looked at mobile home parks uh, like about two and a half years ago when cap rates were really starting to squeeze, interest rates were kind of going up. So that spread, that arbitrage in between the, the interest rate and the cap rate, really that gives you your return. A really good rule of thumb is between like two and a half to 3% spread in between your interest rate on your debt and your cap rate is something really, 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 it's a really good rule of thumb. If you have about two and a half to 3% arbitrage spread in between those, that means you could probably pay investors a really good double digit return on their investment. Um, so when cap rates were going down and interest rates weren't going down with them, they were kind of going up. The arbitrage that spread was squeezing for apartment complexes. So apartments were harder and harder, harder to find deals. That's when we shifted and we're like, well, what else, what other asset class is good? And they're like, you know, we just started doing research and that's where the mobile home park kind of came into our life. And we're like, look, this is, this is, this is, there's an opportunity here. Let's, let's dive in. And so usually your cap rates are going to be higher on mobile home parks versus, um, versus apartment complex. And, and sometimes, uh, you know, there's reasons for that. I, I, I went over some of the disadvantages for that. 
you know, if you look at an apartment complex, an A class apartment is not going to be a high return, but think about how much less management intensive it is versus a D class, you know, apartment that you're going to have 15% cap rate, but Hey, you're going to need like security there 24 seven. You're going to be dealing with some, some uh, like obnoxious behavior. Right. So, um, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, you know, the, the higher cap rate, usually the more management intensive it is, but if you have a hundred percent tenant owned homes in a good market and it's good roads and it's good utilities and, 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 uh, I'm, I'm telling you, it's one of the best investments you could make and kind of going back to an empathetic capitalist, right? Pushing rents fairly, but relentlessly. We talked about how a lot of times lot rents are way below where they need to be way below market, but that doesn't mean you can go in there and increase lot rent a hundred bucks a month right there on the spot. Um, consider, and this is going back to understanding your, your mobile home park resident, right? Imagine if you were living in the mobile home park and you're making like 30 grand a year, 40 grand a year household income. And all of a sudden your landlord went in there and just increased lot rent a hundred dollars a month. I mean, for us, that's like, you know, if for us living in nice apartments or nice homes, that's if our rent or mortgage went up like four or 500 bucks a month, that's like the same thing, right? Respectively. So um, usually 20, 25, maybe 30 bucks a month um, for the first year, right? If, and, and that's if you justify by cleaning it up, you know, improving the landscaping, improving the signage, getting rid of the riffraff, enforcing laws and or enforcing rules, even if it's way below lot rent, you, you know, be an empathetic capitalist. And I'm telling you, it's going to come back uh, very, very, uh, very well for you. And so getting to know the right people at City Hall, I mentioned this already. It's so important that you go introduce yourself to these people, because especially in the mobile home park arena, there's a lot of crappy slumlord mobile home park owners right especially if like you take a city where most of the mobile home park owners are crappy slumlords the city is going to see hey this one's for sale hey there's going to just be another crappy slumlord that's going to buy it so they're automatically going to assume that that who is who you are and what your business model is but if you go are proactive and you introduce yourself to city hall this is who we are we're good people this is our plan we are serious we know, what you're we know what we're doing. And then you make a decision and, and you talk to economic development, the planning and zoning, the city inspector, you know, the fire marshal, even like a smaller tertiary secondary markets, you could go directly talk to the mayor. I mean, if you talk to the mayor and build rapport with the mayor, you're going to be at a big advantage when you need them. And, and uh, you just, again, this is going back to the whole partnership thing. You're partnering with the city to make sure this is a successful asset for you. Um, so this is just a really good thing to do. We implement that in all of our due diligence, pro due diligence processes. We make it, we build a relationship with people at city hall. What questions do you guys have? Because this, this part fires me up. I mean, I love mobile home parks, but the mindset game, how to win the mindset game, this part fires me up. So I hope you're, I hope you're awake. And if you got some questions, please ask them, but I'm all about right. to get excited here. Okay, so um, there is something here. It says, um, if you purchase something as a park owned, everything's park owned, how would you move from park owned to tenant owned? Yeah, that's a really good question. And there's so many strategies to do that. There's a, there's a lot of people who are looking to move into a park that want to be um, owners that are willing to be a, be a park owner or a, a homeowner. Um, and maybe they have some skills, right? Maybe if you have like a fixer upper, uh, one way to do it is if you don't really charge them for the home itself, but maybe it needs a little bit of love. They can come in as a handyman special and they'll work. You could literally just donate the, 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 the trailer to them, or maybe like for 500 bucks or like a thousand bucks, super cheap, um, depending on the condition and the market. And then not only will you offer them um, a very affordable or free unit, you're going to have someone, you're going to have them fix it up for you, but then you can bring your lot rent up to market, right? At the same time. Um, that's a great way to bring your lot rents up to market and make a homeowner very happy, right? And get a unit that's going to be fixed. You're taking a risk doing that unless you could like confirm that they have those skills. Maybe like it's a really good, you know, kind of to keep in mind, they have to prove that they're, that's what they do for work. 
you know, that they work in construction or they're a handyman or they work, you know, Home Depot or something like that, where they are, they're around, they have those skills. Um, but another way, even if they don't have those skills, maybe it's a nice home, um, offering it for very, very, very affordable or something like, like a dollar a month or something for the first year, um, having them move in for free, but again, bringing that lot rent up to market, especially if lot rents below market. Um, and then, like I said, just rent to own. Um, you're offering this nice home uh, for a very affordable mortgage, whether it's 15 grand, 20 grand, depending on the, you know, uh, the condition where you are, you're, you're the middleman. Uh, sometimes, sometimes there's these other cool distributing companies that are manufacture and they distribute and they will create a mortgage between the, the resident and them. And you're kind of the middleman because a lot of times you're supposed to be a licensed broker or dealer in order to sell the mobile home. So if you're not, that's where you have to just be very careful and make sure you understand the local laws um, where you, you can't just create a mortgage out of thin air. It has to be some kind of, um, it has to be some kind of promissory note um, and, and that's, it, that's legal and compliant. So make sure you understand that unless you have a third party doing that, doing that for you. So you're talking about like a, what is an R, R M L O? Yes. I don't remember what the letters stand for, but I remember the letters. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It, that, that is, um, it, that is just the, that is, that is from my understanding and I've never actually dealt with that. That just sounds really familiar that it's, that that's kind of like the license and the training and certification that you kind of need and have to go through in order to be able to sell mobile homes to be considered like a broker dealer. Um, but every state is different. And just, again, make sure you understand your local laws. And um, I can't say this is how it is for the whole United States because every single state and every single city is, is very different. different so yeah. any other questions before we talk about mindset? I am not seeing anything. Mindset is everything. Okay. <laughs> and I say that because you could know all of this stuff about mobile home parks, about multifamily, you could have the most knowledge about real estate investing enough to be the most successful real estate investor ever. But if you don't have the mindset to go with it, it's not going to mean anything at all. And you, if you don't have a success mind, you won't be able to grow to be that person to achieve those goals you have. So, and that, that's when, when you hear people talk about mindset, a lot of times what I think about is, is just mindfulness and understanding what successful people, how they think and how, what sets them apart. And it's, it's their mindset. It's not how much money they make. It's what they, the amount of value that they can give to other people based on their mindset. And they know they're forever students and they continue growing as a person so they can deliver more value to more people. And that is what they receive in abundance. So, you know, the biggest thing, a positive mental attitude is literally just contagious and a negative attitude is like infectious, right? It's almost even worse. It spreads even worse. So if you have a positive mindset, like if you consider what you're saying to yourself and your self talk, that's going to translate into the attitude that you pretty much convey to other people into the world. And that is what you will receive back at you. So I mean, would you rather have, you know, success, like positive results or negative results? Because you're, it starts with your self-talk and, and that positivity is really about how you react to things. And when something happens to you, it's, it's not about what happens to you. It's 10% about what happens to you and 90% of how you react to what happens. Absolutely. Okay. And if you have a positive mental attitude, like regardless of what happens, no problem. I got it, man. Someone else has dealt with this. I'm, I'm going to be able to deal with it too. And a lot of that comes with your confidence and being able to kind of um, respond well um, to, to certain situations. But like I said, yourself, it starts with your self-talk. That'll translate into your mindset and your attitude. And your attitude will turn into your actions and how you act and your behavior and what you convey out to the world. And that's going to generate your results. So be very close. Pay very close attention to what you're talking to yourself in your head. Um, are you, you know, is your self-talk helping you or hurting you bottom line? Like, are you inspiring yourself? Are you motivating yourself? Are you saying, I'm never going to be able to do this, man. I'm, I'm in so much pain. There's, there's, you know, there's not enough time. I don't have enough time. I, you know, I'm not smart enough. You need to cut that out right now today. Um, 
because you have to give yourself that positive reinforcement up here before you can go make it happen. Yeah. Now there's still times where it creeps in. Cause like, of course, like I mean, we're, only, weeks, we're only human. Yeah. A couple of weeks before the summit, like I was crying and I was like, I'm done. I can't do this. I can't make it work. And I was on a, I was getting on a podcast with my friend Peely and she's like, it's already a success. It's this, it's a success because you're doing it. She's like, you're doing great. And here, <laughs> but I was just the- like, Oh, Here's the, the couple takeaways from that. And, and first of all, we're only human. It, it, it's going to happen, especially from our fear driven society. Um, you know, people telling us our whole lives that we can't do something. Right. And so, first of all, it's, it's who you surround yourself with. Like you said, you had a friend or a partner or something kind of give you that positive reinforcement and lift you up instead of pull you down. Um, do you think if you had someone standing next to you said, yeah, you're probably right. This is pretty crazy. You're not gonna be able to do this. How do you think you would have responded at that point? You know, um, you're right. I need to quit. <laughs> exactly. So good thing. You're making good decisions. You're hanging out with the right people. Okay. And so that negative self-talk and that self-doubt is literally just like a brick wall. It's going to stop you. And a lot of it is these, these small words and understanding instead of saying, I can't do this, just say, how can I, how can I figure this out? You're just, you're going to, you know, engage different wiring in your brain, your, your positive and your creative thinking, critical thinking brain. And you're smart enough to figure it out. I guarantee freaking you are, you're just not stopping yourself. You're not putting that brick wall of, I can't do this. So then I'm now I'm just going to give up and go do something else. Like watch Netflix. How can I do this? You're going to think for a minute. You're going to slow down. You'll be like, Oh, I could just call this person. Cause they said that they're an expert at it. And they told me to reach out to them whenever I want. Right. And so you need to remove can't, from your vocabulary. Oh, yeah. You need to remove hope from your vocabulary because hope is not a strategy. Well, I hope I'm going to be able to do this. You know, by the end of the year, I hope I can close on my first property. No, it's up to you. Figure out how to make it happen. Okay. You have full control. You either make it happen or you don't. Hope is not a strategy. That's what people who invest all their money in the stock market are doing. They're hoping that it goes up <laughs> so they can have enough money one day to live off of and treat and, and treat their families well. And, and, and live in retirement, right? And so remove can't from your vocabulary, remove hope from your vocabulary, and there's one more, and remove try from your vocabulary. You're not gonna try to do anything. You're not gonna try to get into multifamily. You are a multifamily real estate investor, and you will successfully become a multifamily real estate investor. And you tell yourself that every day, those affirmations are gonna help you figure out how to do it. Because a try is another word for, well, the first obstacle, I'm going to fail and just give up. No, I'm not going to try anything ever. I'm not going to hope for anything ever. And I'm not ever going to tell myself can't because I'm going to say, how can I? And that all goes back to your why. I mean, this, this really goes back to your why. Why are you doing this? Is it deep enough? Is your why emotional enough? Is it meaningful enough to get you through those brick walls and those I can't and all those people who say you can't and all that fear that our society brings on us? Is your why deep enough. It's so important. I mean, going seven layers deep is an exercise that I think we should all do um, all the time. But next is, how, you know, how do you brain feed? What are you exposing your mind to? Are you watching the news, the CNN, the constant negative news, all that bull crap that's on the news? You understand that their goal is to get ratings and make money. So they, they're just trying to give us information to get ratings and to raise drama. They're not trying to give you information because they want to inform you, all right? They're giving you information to make money and for high ratings. So are you exposing yourself to negative you know, media or are you exposing yourself to the inspiring books and podcasts and things just like Angel is doing for you guys? She's creating these amazing educational, uh, you know, this content. This, you're in the right spot if you're doing this. How else are you brain feeding? Are you surrounding yourself with the right people? Are, you know, who are you influencing on so? Who are you following on social media? What influencers are you really paying attention to, right? Are you looking at the, are you hanging out with the people who gossip um, and talk about other people? Or are you talking, are you hanging out with the capitalists and those entrepreneurs that have a success mind? Because small minds talk about other people, but large minds like your minds talk about how to add more value to this world and how to create ideas to help other people.